Our next speaker is Josh Tenenbaum, uh, who, um, uh, has, whose lab has incubated uh, many probabilistic programming systems over the years. Um, and we're very delighted uh, to hear him speak on uh, the connection between uh, artificial intelligence and human-like intelligence. And probabilistic programs. All right. Great. It's, um, thank you for inviting me. Thanks to the organizers for an absolutely amazing conference. Um, I remember back to the first uh, probabilistic programming NIPS workshop 10 years ago. I think it was 2008. And it's just great to see where the community has come. It's a great honor also to come after Stuart. You'll see many resonances. And Stuart and the work in his group that he told you about inspired me starting when I was first starting off as, a, as an assistant professor at Stanford. The talk you gave on blog. Uh, in 2001 at Stanford um, changed our research and changed my life and indirectly than I think many others here who, who spent some time in our group. So I'm going to talk about, um, well, how I think the tools of probabilistic programs can help us build more human-like forms of intelligence in machine. And that's very much informed by the perspective we have coming from cognitive science and computational models of cognitive science. I think, you know, we're, we, we all know this story. Stuart told a version of this. Um, AI technologies are all around us, but we don't have any real AI. We have machines that do things that we used to think humans could do, but no flexible general purpose intelligence or common sense. And I think many of us are in this room because we know <laughs> something that almost nobody else in the world knows, <laughs> right? There's so many more people, and as Stuart said, billions of dollars being poured into some alternative approaches, but we know <laughs> that the things that collectively this group of people know are closer to knowing the answer to how to do this than anybody else in the world, I think that's actually true, and anybody else in, in human history. That doesn't mean we're close, we're still far, <laughs> but <laughs> it's incredibly exciting to be here and now. To know where to go, you have to think about what we're missing. And again, echoing some of Stuart's themes, I think part of it is this, right? What's driving all, you know, so many of the successes in current technologies in AI are basically advances in pattern recognition. That includes, of course, deep learning, but also just the maturing of the entire machine learning toolkit. Okay? But we have to recognize that human intelligence is about so much more than just recognizing patterns and making predictions. It's about building models of the world, right? Being able to explain and understand what we see, being able to imagine things that we haven't seen or maybe that nobody's ever seen before. And then to make plans to make those things real, solve the problems that come up along the way, build new models, and share our models. A lot of our model building doesn't just come from data, but it comes from communication and teaching each other. So what will it take to engineer these aspects of human intelligence in machines? Well, we know the answer, <laughs> right? Um, but I want to present a, a, you know, a sort of a high-level overview of, a, of, of two parts of this problem, which again, um, are really inspired by thinking about how human intelligence develops from infancy on up through childhood and adulthood. Really, what we have to distinguish are what, you know, and again, AI people have, going back to Turing, have recognized this, right? There's the question of what do we start with, and then how do we learn all the rest? Because I think it's now well understood that human intelligence doesn't just start off as a blank slate. It starts with a lot, and yet it also has very powerful learning mechanisms to go beyond that, okay? Um, the key word on, on both of these parts here is the word symbol or symbolic, right? Because I think, again, what part of what, I mean, the number one thing that motivates me and our group uh, to think about probabilistic programming is to combine the power of, of uh, data and statistics and probability with symbolic architectures, as Stuart gave so wonderfully in his overview there. Okay. So let's talk about what, what I think we need to do and, and how we've been working on this. Um, think about the intelligence that I'll show you in these movies of just these very young children. I'll show you two movies of one and a half year olds. And what we're thinking about here is what we call their intuitive physics and their intuitive psychology. These are the basic common sensibilities that every child has, but yet, as of yet, no robot or any machine. So by at least at anything like this level. So think about what it would take to give a robot this kind of basic understanding of blocks, toys, cups, what this kid is doing as he's stacking up cups into a bigger stack. And then, as you'll see if you keep watching, he puts a little stack on a bigger stack to make an even bigger stack. Right? We don't have any robots that can think about objects, the physics, the forces of contact, and how those link up to the symbolic plans at anything like this kid's level. If we did have that, it would be amazing. Right? And again, I think it's pretty clear why we need to combine these different aspects of intelligence. Or by intuitive psychology, 
Think about what's going on in this one and a half year old in these famous experiments from Felix Warnikin and Tomasello, right? That kid in the back, the subject in the experiment, he's watching an action that he's never seen before, just like you, unless you've seen this in a talk by me or somebody else, right? Um, or on YouTube. Yet he understands what the person is trying to do and even how to help him out. So think about how does he understand that? How does he understand what's going on inside that person's minds based on his action? Okay, well, you know, if we could have robots that could do that, they would be not only cute and sweet, but amazing, all right, to help out around the house. So we want to build engineering models of the pictures that you see here, which are our take on the mental models inside these kids' heads. Now, we can make a model of intuitive physics like that. We can draw it as something like a graphical model, and we all recognize that's a hidden Markov model, right? But for me, one of the key things motivating probabilistic programs and the work that our group has done with probabilistic programs is what we call the thick nodes and arrows of that picture, right? Um, the intuitive physics and vision is not just about a fixed finite dimensional vector space representation and mappings between them. It's about living in a world of objects, just like Stuart said, but also having the expressiveness to capture the functions that relate state and dynamics, such as actual physics, okay? Or think about the causal uh, models underlying planning. So here we take probabilistic programming languages, and I just mean this very generally here, right? I mean um, a toolkit for combining all these good ideas that our field has come up with over the decades, symbolic reasoning for knowledge representation and abstraction, probabilistic inference on causal models with hierarchy, and of course, the pattern, tools of pattern recognition. Again, I think that the reason why th this room has, has everything we need or has the best tool set is because we are starting to understand how to bring these ideas together into our current state-of-the-art languages. And then and our group has, has specialized um, in ra uh, wrapping inside these frameworks tools for simulating how the world works and what it looks like and even how people act in it based on what we call the game engine in your head, right? And this is a set of ideas that has developed in our group very much together with some of Akash's thinking. I'll show one, one instance of uh, one of his re most recent developments here. I'm mostly focusing on things um, that are more on the cognitive modeling side. But this idea that, again, I think, I don't remember, it was probably at least 10 years ago when we started thinking about this, that the tools of modern video game engines, graphics engines, game style physics engines, maybe even planning engines, could be a good first approximation to what evolution has actually built into our brains as these common sense knowledge representations. And what motivated our approach, you know, Stuart was contrasting the declarative versus functional imperative approach. What motivated things like church or other probabilistic programming languages that our group was interested in was trying to capture these kinds of abilities and to take these functions as the basic uh, ways to represent the, ca the causal um, forces and relations at work in the world. So we built, for example, what we called an intuitive physics engine. Pete Battaglia and Jess Hamrick did this about five or six years ago in our group. And again, I'm, many of you have probably seen this, but if you haven't before, the idea was, you know, going back to Bloch's world, because as Marvin Minsky says, there's a lot more in it <laughs> than computer vision ever got out of it. And building a model that could answer, you know, an, an open-ended set of questions about these objects it, there was no machine learning here at all, no, no learning or training at all, but just by, take, by being able to do probabilistic inference, combining game physics and simple kinds of renderers, to see a scene, to work backwards to a physical representation, to take a couple of posterior samples, this is like a kind of Monte Carlo sampling, but just a small number of samples, to take the average of, of short rollouts from those samples in the physics engine, that was the basis for very quantitatively predictive models of many different questions. Will these blocks fall? Which way will they fall? How far will they fall? What happens if they're, if they're made out of different materials? How does that, or one material is much heavier than another, how does that change the result? I'll just give you one demo, which um, when we introduce this in our, um, well, you'll see, you'll see why I think this is interesting. It's a demo which um, we introduced this in our group, again, a few years ago, six or seven years ago. Dan Roy, who was uh, a student here at the time, said, this is gonna be the killer app that kills deep learning. <laughs> More on that in a second. <laughs> Um, but you can see why, forget whether it kills deep learning, you can see why it motivates um, probabilistic programming, okay? Um, because I'm going to give you a task that I'm going to specify in language, and if you, unless you've, you know, seen this talk before or seen this task, you have no training data, although, of course, you have a lot of experience that you can build on. But think about how you can answer a question like this. What if this table is bumped hard enough to knock some of the blocks onto the floor? Is it more likely to be red or yellow blocks? So you tell me, red or yellow? How about here? Yellow. 
Okay, you get the idea. <laughs> I just made, gave you 10 samples from this world. Um, but it's enough to see, and, and I want to do this as an interactive demo, because I want you to experience what it's like to make these judgments, how fast. And you can see some are faster, some are slower. In the room, there's more uncertainty in some cases than others. That is, you know, real approximate probabilistic inference in a probabilistic program in action. How do we think you do this? Well, it's something like this, right? You see a scene, you somehow, as we say, de-render it into some kind of game state representation. Somehow, you, you make an inference about the input to a graphics engine that roughly looks like that scene, and now you can roll that out in your simulator. For example, you can model a small bump of the table, you can model a large bump of the table. You just do a couple of those, it doesn't really matter I mean, the whole point of these things is at the level of common sense, it doesn't really matter uh, whether it's a small bump or a big pump or which direction it comes from. If you have a clear judgment, the end result is basically the same, and it's basically clear in just a few time steps, even in a low precision simulation, right? You don't have to run this all the way to the end to know the answer. And that kind of model is able to predict people's judgments just as well in this novel task as in something that you all have a lot more experience with, like playing the game of Jenga and asking, you know, is this stable or not? Okay, um, so this is what Dan said was gonna kill deep learning. Um, the truth is that it hasn't yet, and our goal really never was to kill deep learning. <laughs> what we were talking about was the ethos that deep learning is the answer to everything, right? Of course, and we, all, we already know that. In, in fact, what's happened is deep learning has helped out <laughs> solve these problems, <laughs> right? So now, um, both in our group and a number of other people, again, I think Frank's gonna talk about this when it comes to inference compilation, and, and uh, you know, uh, Noah and others have worked on this and amortized inference, right? The idea that actually, the hard inverse inference problems, like inverting a graphics engine, for example, deep learning can be great for that, all right? And there's even evidence uh, that there's actually systems in the brain, deep neural networks in the brain that might actually be involved in doing something like this. We, we can even point to the parts of the brain where they might integrate with what we think is actually the physics engine. So I won't go into the details, but work from, that came out of our group by Ilker Yildirim and Jajin Wu and others in the Galileo system, or what we've called deanimation, show how to actually combine deep networks for inverse rendering with physics engines and do a really good job of uh, quickly but, but really accurately at the grain of common sense seeing what's going to happen. The same kind of idea can apply in what we've called the intuitive psychology setting, right? So here, the, the goal is to figure out what somebody's goal is. Watch this movie in slow motion. You're going to see a woman reaching for one of 16 objects on the table, and, and the question for you is which one is she reaching for? Just raise your hand when you think you know the answer. hands. Okay, most of the hands up now. Okay, good. Um, so um, most of you, you know, some, some raised your hand sooner, some later. Almost everybody's hand was up about the time when that dashed line, I think, was up there. I couldn't really tell because I was looking at you, but when I looked back, it was just about when the dashed line peaked. Okay, that's not data from an experiment now. That's the predictions of a model. Okay, how does that model work? It doesn't do any really traditional computer vision. I mean, you could say, oh, the way you see what somebody is reaching for is you just, you know, analyze motion direction. And in this scene, that might work okay. But real motion understanding is about inverse planning. And again, here I'm building on a lot of work that was done in our group by Chris Baker, as well as Tao Gao and others. And the idea in in this case is to actually have a forward model of planning based on a Mujoko physics engine and to say, well, if it conditioned on what your goal is, what would be the most efficient reach? So here you can see forward simulations from, from an older version of Mujoko for each of the possible goals. And those bars going up and down, those are the Bayesian posterior probabilities of an inverse model. The real power of this kind of approach comes in more interesting kinds of settings, like in a scene like this, how can you tell what she's reaching for when she sits up before she even starts to reach? You, she hasn't moved her arm, but you already have a pretty good idea of where she's going, right? Or here, again, the fact that she starts moving on that side of the table changes very much what you think she's reaching for, okay? Because you understand she's taking efficient actions. Or here's Tao. How do you understand what he's doing here? Right? Does anyone understand why he's reaching in a strange way? What's he doing? It's unusual here. Yeah, he's reaching over a piece of glass. That, that computer vision, normal computer vision action understanding isn't gonna solve that problem because the obstacle is literally invisible except for a little line, right? But we understand that people reach around obstacles. Or if we wanna understand why in scenes like this, this looks like one person is trying to help somebody else. This one here 
looks not like helping, but the opposite, right? <laughs> so again, by building multi-agent models where agents' expected utility functions depend on their expectation of another expected agent's expected utility, that's essentially what it means to help or to hinder if it's a negative dependence, okay? We've built those models in the cognitive setting for some time now and even shown that they can make sense of how infants understand helping and hindering. But, it, but here, now the, the idea is to apply this in a robotic and computer vision setting. We can get, vision can give us the people, but we need probabilistic programs to tell us what's going on inside their heads. Um, and here I just wanted to mention some recent work from Vakash, which uh, it's, it's been, uh, it's just under review. I guess this was an AI stats submission, um, but it's by Vakash and some colleagues at Intel. And here they're approaching a number of these problems, including inverse graphics type problems, as well as these uh, inverse planning problems, right? And they are um, also, like I mentioned, using neural networks to accelerate things here by learning kind of proxy simulators, and then by using a kind of approximate Bayesian computation enabled by some clever adaptive tree data structures, they're able to build real-time approximate Bayesian inference in probabilistic programs for a number of these kinds of tasks. Okay. In the last few minutes here, um, I just want to give you part two. Uh, a lot of this will be a call out to some talks you're going to see later on, all right? But if we want to say, how do we go beyond the core intuitive physics based on, say, game engine programs, all right, um, then, uh, and, and in inverse planning, then we need basically <laughs> um, some way of building new kinds of intuitive theories. In cognitive science, this has sometimes been called the theory theory, the idea that, that people, just like scientists, see data and they see what's going on, but they don't do it by you know, just running statistics any more than Newton ran uh, deep learning or any other kind of ML to come up with his laws. Darwin didn't do that. Mendeleev didn't do that, <laughs> right? Um, or Mendel. Um, uh, or even you know, the ancient Greeks understand, understood how eclipses work. How did they do this? <laughs> right? Well, we might say they did it by writing probabilistic programs. Okay? Um, in developmental psychology, the tradition of the child as scientist studies how children's play and children's thinking is a form of informal experimentation. And like scientists playing around in the lab, children playing around in the crib, right, they are doing effectively kinds of experiments that are not perfect, neither are scientists in the lab most of the time, okay, but they are what make us the smart, even our, our youngest children, the smartest uh, learners in our known universe. So when you try to turn this into an engineering perspective, you, it gives us what we call the child as coder or the child as hacker. Right? Of course, at MIT and in this community, we know hacking is a good thing, but sometimes we call this the child as coder for the broader world who has mixed feelings about hacking. But the basic idea, right, that again, uh, is, I mean, here we, I think we all accept this, is that our knowledge should be more like a code base than like the weights of a network, neural network or Bayesian network. And that means learning has to be more like coding than some process of gradient descent or even some, you know, stochastic search or stochastic search-like inference, okay? So the key question then is, you know, what kinds of programs and what kind of program writing programs could do this? And we all recognize that if our goal is now to learn programs, that's an extremely hard problem, right? We can call this the hard problem of learning because it's much harder than learning in a neural network, right? The space of programs, unlike the space of, you know, weight space in a neural network, has no nice continuous uh, structure, no nice geometry that gives you gradients that you can just roll downhill on at least most of the time, okay? It's a much harder search problem, yet somehow children are able to solve it. So how are they able to do that? And a lot of the work that, again, led me to probabilistic programs, going back um, some, some uh, years in our group, was really trying to navigate this fundamental trade-off that we're all familiar with. This is true whether we're doing inference or learning, right? That we, we always have to trade off how tractable is our inference with how expressive is our representation. And you know, we're, we're always looking for sweet spots there, either things which are designed to be tractable but are surprisingly expressive, or approaches which are designed to be expressive but are surprisingly tractable. And again, you saw some really nice examples of that at the end of Stuart's talk. In our work, think about things that you know, we did that, that maybe originally were not done in terms of probabilistic programming, but you've already seen, like say in Zubin's work or in Ulrich's talk yesterday, where in Vakash's group with Ulrich, they've nicely kind of translated some of these ideas over into formal probabilistic programming languages. Why did we work on the automated statistician, right? I mean, the idea here was to be able to look at data and not just extrapolate it in some smooth, generic way, but to see the underlying structure that could let us extrapolate what was really going on, and we built some kind of, you know, tractable le symbolic language for functions that, that 
that turned out to be surprisingly expressive, right? You can capture many of the different kinds of things going on in time series, and you can even, it's even expressive enough that the algorithm's output were, you know, PDF files in NIPS format, right? When you run that original algorithm from James Lloyd and David Duvino, this is the output, <laughs> right? That's, that's real explainable AI, okay, at least in the data science setting. And a, and a step towards automating, in some sense, you know, writing programs as scientific theory building. Or the work that Brendan Lake did in our lab a few years ago, right? Why do we do this? It wasn't because we wanted to solve character recognition in all the world's languages from one example, although that was a cool demo. It was because this was a warm up towards learning very simple probabilistic programs, where the probabilistic programs capture the structure of these simple visual objects. And we wanted to show that with the right kind of probabilistic programming language specialized to this domain, you could induce the probabilistic programs that describe these simple visual objects from just one example. I won't go to the details because a lot of people know this work, but I'm just trying to say why do we do this and how does it fit into the bigger picture. Okay. Um, but if we really want to build things like intuitive theories, real common sense knowledge, we have to move to the other end, right? And I think that's where the most exciting frontiers are now. We have to start with representations that we know are expressive enough and general enough and say now how can we make them tractable? And here, but, you know, the, the, here's where I think this idea of the child as coder becomes more than just a metaphor. I think we really need to look at all the activities of coding or all the ways we hack on our code to make it more awesome. And we have to say, all of these activities have, have analogs in children's learning and in our machine systems, right? It, one way to make your code better is to tune some of its parameters to optimize its accuracy or its time. That's why we, that, you know, usually then we can use gradient descent, at least if the code is differentiable. But, you know, all these other activities, um, you know, writing code, debugging code, fixing existing functions, writing new functions, writing whole new libraries of functions or even whole new languages, all those activities have analogs in both human learning and need to have analog if machine learning is really going to lead to general purpose kinds of intelligence. All right, so, so how do we do that? Well, you know, this is a hard problem um, which, for which we are just beginning, we as a community, to make some progress. But I'll just point to some recent work that I've been very fortunate to be involved with. This is, is um, work that's been led by Kevin Ellis, who's an advanced PhD student here at MIT. And he's worked together with me and Armando Solar Lazama, a programming languages researcher in CSAIL. And over a series of NIPS papers, um, he and Armando and colleagues have taken the PL toolkit of program synthesis, drawing on go another thing that good thing 10 years ago, Armando's PhD thesis, which introduced the sketch-based system for automated programming from a program sketch, all right, and combining that with the idea of Bayesian learning, with the idea of um, uh, learning the kinds of programs from few examples that we've been talking about here. And uh, I'll just point you to some of their papers, but um, really what I want to do is just advertise uh, one of two, so, so Kevin has two um, NIP spotlights this year on, on various ways of doing this. And both of them, again, they don't, they're not opposed to deep learning. In fact, they use deep learning to help make some things work. But the thinking, the intelligence is done by a combination of program synthesis methods, and uh, which is a real form of symbolic reasoning and thinking about probabilistic programs as the inductive bias framework. So in one, one thing that he did together with Daniel Ritchie, um, was they built a system for interpreting hand-drawn diagrams. So the system takes as input diagrams like those, it parses them into a cleaner symbolic form like you can see there, and then it actually outputs code which, which expresses the underlying symbolic program structure of these pictures. They use a neural network j just to solve as a vision front end to, solve, to parse into an initial low-level symbolic form, but then there's a DSL right, for actually drawing, which, which, which they use to synthesize a program that can then be extrapolated in all sorts of ways to draw, if you like, samples from things that the person could have drawn but didn't. So I'll just show you uh, this one nice little demo here, where each of the white drawings is a diagram that, that we drew, and then the black ones are an extrapolation or an imagination of where it could go by, by inducing the program and then running it forward a little bit more. And again, it's a very small step towards something we might actually call intelligence, 
But we think these are the kinds of steps we need. So what you'll hear about from Kevin later on in the session is ways now of, of taking similar ideas, but building, built, actually growing them in significant ways so that not only do we learn programs within a given DSL, but we're actually able to extend and even learn whole new DSLs and ways that, again, use, use some cool ideas from neural networks and the old wake sleep idea, but really it's really only the coming together of this and maturing of the AI toolkit, the full toolkit, that I think is starting to make this kind of program learning possible. So just to wrap up then, I've tried to show you a, a set of ideas that we and, and colleagues have been developing, which, you know, this it's, it's not just the probabilistic programming toolkit, but it's both where I think it came from for us, why we got to this, and where I think it might be going. And if you're interested in what I might call real AI, <laughs> um, I, I think this is the most exciting uh, time to be trying that out. Thanks. Uh, and uh, we have a little bit of time uh, to shorten the community discussion section at the end of this session, so and uh, to push the uh, the start of the coffee break a little bit late. So with that in mind, I would like to take one question. The, the community discussion session is actually at the beginning of the next session. Oh, oh. so Sorry about that. what we'll do is we'll keep with the normal schedule for the talks. Then we'll have a coffee break, and then we'll start a little bit later, and we'll shorten the community session at the start of the next session. Okay, great. So one question. Maybe the next speaker wants to set up. Yeah, well, well. Speak next speaker sets up. Thanks. Okay, I'll ask a question. Go for it. Um, uh, so uh, to to make progress towards um, realizing the AI vision that you articulated here, yeah. um, what do you think this community needs to provide? Um. Well, uh, I guess I would say um, uh, two kinds of things, which you know people are already working on. But I think you know most of what I showed you when I said we use this probabilistic program or we use this or we integrate neural networks in this way, most of that are not based in, an, in a kind of uh, general purpose probabilistic programming framework. Some of some of them are. Uh, your paper is. I mean, I think that's you know that's where a lot of this community has really focused on is is taking the kinds of things that I might be gesturing at here and putting them into. Uh, ideally software that's as mature as TensorFlow. So, you know, you guys need to build the TensorFlow <laughs> for um, this vision, <laughs> I think, um, or PyTorch, you know, and, and so on. Languages that are that um, accessible and generally usable. That's number one. Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, and just further, further, I mean, and this community is already good at this, but I'll just emphasize this even more. Um, what I think we've learned over AI, and again, Stuart has probably taught me this more than anybody, and I try to teach my own students this, is that the way to success, you have to have a vision of what problems you're trying to solve and what are important techniques. But you have to recognize that <laughs> you don't know the answer. <laughs> And other people know other parts of the answer. And so being open-minded about what people outside of even AI, like Armando didn't think of himself as an AI researcher until a few years ago. People building video game engines didn't think of themselves as doing AI. And then it turned out both their hardware and maybe now their software are actually a, a key part of what we need. So in open-mindedness to the, the, the much broader toolkit of engineering and cognitive science and looking to that together with mature software engineering, um, you know, that's, that's I think what we need. Thanks. <laughs> 